Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about the development of the Space Shuttle, the Space Shuttle Enterprise, and I focused a lot on its aerodynamics. And in the process of doing my research, I found this amazing photo, which I thought initially looked like the result of a computer simulation. But in fact, it's a 1970s photograph of a test of a shuttle model in a Mark 20 helium wind tunnel using electron beam fluorescence. And there were a lot of questions about this. How exactly do you make a hypersonic wind tunnel? Why would you use helium instead of air? And what's with this electron beam fluorescence stuff? So let's explain all this. Let's start with how you make a hypersonic wind tunnel. Now, if you're only casually familiar with wind tunnels, you might know enough that you think of them as a tunnel with big fans pushing or pulling air through them. And then you would have a location where you can mount test objects with windows so you can look at them, so you can observe the aerodynamic flow around these things. The tunnel might be open to the world, or it could be arranged in a loop with air circulating and reducing the power requirements. And there'll be all sorts of vanes and grid type devices to direct and control airflow and try to make the flow as smooth and laminar as possible. Either way, if you know anything about aircraft, you'll know that aircraft driven by propellers aren't really going supersonic. There was the Republic XF-84H Thunder Screech, which was an attempt to get a prop-driven plane close to or even past Mach 1, but in the end, after testing, it was vastly more successful at converting aviation fuel into noise pollution. Propellers and fans are good at adding a small amount of speed to a large amount of air, and that's not a good way to get supersonic flows. It might be possible, but generally it's prohibitive. Anyway, a wind tunnel isn't just about the fans pushing the air around. There's a lot of other engineering required to make air flow the way that you need it to. And a big part of the wind tunnel design is the shape of those tunnels the air is flowing through. If you're even casually aware of physics, you've probably heard of Bernoulli's laws. And these are a set of very simple relationships that explain how pressure and velocity of a fluid changes as it moves through pipes with changing cross sections. So if a fluid flows from a wide pipe into a narrow pipe, then conservation of mass says that the velocity of the fluid has to increase so that the same amount of mass enters each section of pipe and leaves. So this, you see this if you're playing around with a hose and you cover up the end of it with your finger and you restrict the flow, the water starts to flow out faster and sprays out. So wind tunnels can use this. After all, a tunnel can be considered just like a pipe from Bernoulli, the point of view of Bernoulli's laws. So you'll see wind tunnels with wide sections that will narrow down just before the test section with the models, therefore increasing the speed of the air where the model is being tested. Ha, huh. so you hadn't thought of that before. Now you might think that's the problem solved. We just keep shrinking the tube down until your subsonic flow becomes supersonic and shrink it even more and you'll get hypersonic flows, right? Seems to make sense, but actually this doesn't work. See, the commonly cited version of Bernoulli's laws is for incompressible fluids, and you can only get away with approximating gases as incompressible fluids to speeds of about you know, Mach 0.3. You can still make the air go faster and faster, but it's not a simple linear relationship anymore between cross sections and flow rates. The air spend some of its time getting compressed, the density rises so you don't see the same increase in speed that you would expect with an incompressible fluid. But if you push hard enough, the flow eventually reaches Mach 1. And then pushing it even harder doesn't increase the flow speed. It just increases the density and pressure and temperature where you've got it choked down. So this is a condition called choked flow. The next step then is to allow this gas in the choked flow state to expand out through a widening tunnel section. And what happens then is all that stored energy in the form of pressure and temperature pushes the gas to higher speeds past Mach 1 and getting faster as the cross section of the tunnel expands. So for supersonic gas flows in a pipe, the intuitive form of Bernoulli's law is actually reversed. Increasing the area of the tunnel accelerates the flow and decreasing the area slows the flow. Now, many of my longtime viewers might be thinking that they've seen me explain this phenomenon before, and you're exactly right, because it's the same phenomenon used 
in rocket engine nozzles to maximize the exhaust velocity of the gas. You have this high pressure combustion chamber, you have a throat that generates the choked flow condition, and then you have the gently expanding nozzle section to accelerate the gas and maximize your specific impulse. And then, in wind tunnel speak, or wind tunnel examples, there is the thermal structures test tunnel at Langley that wanted to simulate re-entry conditions. And they did this by effectively building a hypersonic wind tunnel that was a methane fueled rocket engine, generating high temperature flow conditions at Mach 7. You literally were burning methane and oxygen through a nozzle and expanding that. And in the test section, your nozzle, your model was sitting there in the nozzle section. Now, one difference with wind tunnels and rocket engines is that the throat and expansion geometry in rockets has a circular cross section and that reduces hot spots. But it's common to see wind tunnels that only contract and expand in one dimension. And some of them actually even make the throat and nozzle adjustable in real time so that you can change it during the test. Others, you can vary the, uh, the nozzle geometry by opening the tunnel up and replacing blocks that will constrict the flow. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. With the super expa supersonic expansion phenomenon, you can now see how it's possible to turn high pressure subsonic flows into supersonic or even hypersonic flows. But wait, in driving this, you don't need the fans anymore. You actually want high pressures and fans aren't good at that. They're good at adding velocity. So you replace those fans with pumps that compress the gas more effectively. And so if you're sustaining a high, your know, large tunnel at high flow rates, this can actually require a lot of power, like hundreds of megawatts of power to drive some of these tunnels. And, but you know, if you just have a short test you wanna run with your know, rapid response instrumentation, you can perform all sorts of tests very quickly using a blowdown tunnel. They're basically driven by compressed gas tanks where there's a high pressure reservoir of gas that gets pumped up to whatever is necessary. You open the valve and then blow that over your tunnel for to get results for like minutes, sometimes fractions of a second. And there's actually, they'll also have blowdown spheres, which are big vacuum spheres. And in this picture, you can see these massive spherical objects. They're not pressure tanks. They are vacuum tanks that the gas flows into. So anyway, now that we've explained how you can make a hypersonic wind tunnel, why is this tunnel using helium instead of air? Well, there's another side effect to the expansion process. That expanding gas takes energy and it cools down as a consequence. This is just conservation of energy um, as the, you know, the heat and the pressure are converted into kinetic energy. The faster you go, the colder the gas gets. And if there's moisture in the air, it'll condense out. And this is a similar phenomenon to the condensation cones seen around uh, trans, uh, transonic aircraft and rockets. So air in wind tunnels needs to be dried to avoid this effect. And that can be a serious technical challenge if you're also continually having to draw in huge amounts of fresh air. Uh, as you go faster though, the temperature can drop even further to the point where air itself liquefies. That's about 55 Kelvin. And that sets the limit on how fast a tunnel can simulate. For air, this is about Mach 4, Mach 5. Uh, one way around this problem is to then heat the air before the throat so it remains above the liquefaction point when it's expanded. And it only takes a modest amount of heating, about 50 Celsius to make a Mach 5 wind tunnel work with air. But for Mach 10, the air temperature needs to be about 900 Celsius. And Mach 20 would demand temperatures of over 4,000 Celsius. At that point, necessitating some exotic systems for heating the air and stopping it from destroying the wind tunnel. Another alternative is to use a gas with a lower boiling point. And helium is pretty much the best thing you can get in that department. So you can push a helium wind tunnel driven by room temperature helium up to Mach 20 without spending any time solving thermal management problems to keep it uh, from liquefying. Now helium obviously isn't the perfect stand-in for air. It's monatomic, which alters its physical, its gas properties compared to like diatomic gases of oxygen and nitrogen. But also realize that if you have to heat your air to 5,000 Celsius to keep it from liquefying, that very likely changes its chemistry compared to regular air. So a Mach 20 air wind tunnel wouldn't be that realistic either. 
It's one of many compromises that engineers have to accept when they're doing tests in these extreme regimes like that. There's always compromises. And you know, uh, this kind of nozzle-based wind tunnel isn't the only way to solve high Mach value uh, designs. There's like shock tunnels, expansion tunnels, light gas guns pushing pistons, there's arc jets. You know, there's all sorts of different techniques, some of which address some parts of the problem better than others. There's no one best technique short of actually flying a heavily instrumented test article in the test conditions. So anyway, the final part is about that electron beam fluorescence, which is giving the image its beautiful appearance. This is what we see. Wind tunnels are used to analyze the aerodynamic qualities of models, and there are many techniques for measuring how the air flows are disturbed in the vicinity of the model. You might have seen some uh, Schleier imaging, uh, which basically captures changes in density in the flows by exploiting how the refractive index changes as the density changes, right? Now, under the right condition, you can see, actually see these even outside a, an imaging system. You can see them like from planes. I've, I've literally looked out on a passenger plane and been able to see transonic shocks forming in some region, very, you know, just as shadows on the wing. Anyway, in the case of the hypersonic helium tunnels, the Schleiern imaging doesn't work well because helium has a much lower refractive index in air. And also the process of expanding the gas to get hypersonic flows means that the gas density is way lower and that lower density means an even lower refractive index. So it just doesn't work very well. So instead, they use an electron beam shooting that through the helium and this excites the atoms into a higher energy state and they want to drop to a lower state and release this as light. But the rate at which they release this light depends upon the density of the gas. So when the gas piles up into high density regions, those are much brighter and you can see the glow more obviously where these high density shocks are forming. Now, depending upon the testing, they might also include other trace amounts of other gases. And nitrogen is one example that does a better job at emitting the light and illustrating those all important changes in density near the objects. So now you know what's going on with this absolutely amazing 50 year old photo. And hopefully you've actually learned a little bit about hypersonic wind tunnels in the process. I'm Scott Manley, fly safe.